you. Uh, I want to acknowledge, first of all, that uh, most of the literature I've read, uh, they've spoken rather highly of you. Some have gone so far as to dedicate works to you. How I was in and his black abolitionist, uh, Leon Hope, his work on Mississippi Freedom Summer. These men felt that you were one of the main causes of the squeal that, that, uh, uh, that these subsequent movements uh, fought on. So I'm honored to talk to you this morning, and uh, I'd like for you to share with me uh, your, some of your experiences and uh, uh, accounts of, of, of the role you played in SCLC and uh, your interpretations of roles other individuals played in the organization that you might be uh, necessary to give me more insight as to the dynamics involved and the programs that SCLC ultimately uh, uh, initiated. So uh, my first question to you, as I was saying earlier, is can you uh, mention to me or point out to me other factors aside from uh, the Montgomery movement and say the 1954 Supreme Court decision, which may have contributed to uh, the founding of SCLC when it was founded in 57? Well, I think the, what you have is a question of continuity of struggle. Uh, you said that uh, people had referred to me largely in terms of uh, maybe being a factor. And that, I think, sprang from the fact that in, uh, say, several years uh, before that, a number of years before that, in the 40s, in the late 30s and in the 40s, but the 40s in particular, I was working with the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. And a primary function of mine was to um, go into areas, maybe some of the areas that had not been visited in a long while. Um, for instance, I used to leave New York uh, sometime in February and go into Florida. I'd start at the uh, of St. Pete's Tampa. And that was because we did not have, the association didn't have an active branch in Miami at the time. And so we just worked around St. Peter Tampa and up the east or the west coast, uh, uh, Palm Beach, West Palm Beach, and on and on and up, Pompano, small places. And get Jacksonville, from Jacksonville to Tallahassee, Tallahassee to Pensacola, Pensacola into Georgia, into Mobile. Mobile uh, through Alabama, Alabama to Georgia, Georgia up until you came into Virginia. So that had been my uh, itinerary for several years. And in the process, it was uh, not to be unthought of that I uh, had touched a number of people who had not been visited for a long time by association personnel. So. That may account for the uh, whatever historical impact I may have had. In addition to that, uh, at 54, the 54 decision uh, was frequently interpreted by people as being the end of the struggle because the associate, uh, the NAACP struggle had been one of legal action to a large extent, and uh, the 1954 decision culminated a effort on the part of the lawyers of the association to raise the question of the constitutionality of racial segregation, and this was the case on which that got verbalization, and so that becomes a historical monument and to some people, it almost was interpreted as being the end of the struggle. But as we have seen from the history of uh, uh, the question of racial segregation and discrimination, we have had uh, court action that has been nullified uh, from time immemorial. Go back, you must go back to the Reconstruction period, and I'm not going into that, but you go back there. Much of what was supposedly gained uh, in the 40s and 50s legally had been supposedly secured to us 
in uh, the, uh, the pride in, to right after the Reconstruction period. And you know those laws were nullified. So uh, SCLC, why? It was... You were about to speak to the why of SCLC. Well, uh, I think the basic why of SCLC has to do with what had taken place in the 54 decision and the unthought of Montgomery bus boycott. But before you can evaluate the bus boycott, you have to understand how it came about. And it didn't come out of a vacuum. There were two people in Montgomery who had functioned uh, with the NAACP over the years. And they were Mrs. Rosa Parks and Ed E. D. Nixon, not Ed, his, uh, I don't know what his name was, but E. D. Nixon. Where did E. D. Nixon get his fire? He got his fire, his sense of social action, from being a member of the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters and the struggle that it had waged over the uh, years. And so when the Montgomery bus boycott, let's call it, ended successfully, here you had a social phenomenon that had not taken place uh, in the history of those of us who were around at that time, where hundreds of people and even thousands of people, just ordinary people, had taken a position that put them in a very uncomfortable, uh, uh, at least made life less comfortable for them when they decided to walk rather than to ride the buses. And this was a mass action, and a mass action that anybody who looked at the social scene would have to appreciate and wonder, those of us who, were, who believe that mass, only through mass action are we going to eliminate certain things. Uh, would have to think in terms of how do you, how does this get carried on? And so, uh, whatever the reasons or however the historical uh, accidents of history or whatever else that precipitated Martin as the president, and that's quite a story. I'm not going into it because you didn't come here for that. But uh, whatever those factors were, he was there as the spokesman for uh, the boycott. And out of the boycott, he became a uh, worldwide known individual, articulating uh, the strivings and the hopes and so forth of the people who were involved in the boycott. At this time, you were working with the NAACP. No, at 54? No, at 57. No, no, no. See, I left the NAACP uh, nationally in uh, 46. And then I served, uh, I worked with the local branch, and I think I was the president in the 50s, somewhere in the 50s. In 1957, at the time that uh, SCLC began, was formally organized, I think that's when it was formally organized, uh, I had, uh, I was doing a a program that uh, of trying to uh, educate or trying to stimulate action on the part of black and Puerto Rican parents in respect to the school situation. See, the uh, New York City had taken, uh, had set up a commission or the commission on uh, de facto segregation, I believe, I'm not sure, but they were, they were supposed to be eliminating de facto segregation in the school system in New York. And so for the summer of 57, uh, we had weekly uh, meetings with parents in the different boroughs uh, trying uh, for social, for, I mean, for getting them to uh, deal with the question 
of uh, their schools, what was happening to their children. And uh, that's how, where Kenneth Clark came into the picture on the whole area of the... Uh, okay. I'd like to back up a second and I'll get to a you, you mentioned the fact that E.D. Nixon uh, probably uh, got a lot of his fire from his area of affiliation with Sleepy Car Holders. And Ms. Rosa Park had been uh, NAAC member for a long time. But I also read an account as to where Ms. Park had attended earlier the Highland of Folk School. This was a place in Montego, Tennessee, as you know, where by young, uh, people would go, you know, aspiring to be leaders in the community to get different kinds of uh, training as to how they may best go about doing it. And it was right after that that Ms. Park decided that she wasn't going to give up her seat. So it's a question over here as to where her primary motivation came from as to the reason she didn't give up her seat. Have you heard that story before about the well, Montego Florence? Sure. Well, first place, the first time Mrs. Parks left Montgomery uh, to go anywhere, she says, I don't know, was to come to Atlanta to a regional leadership training conference that uh, I happen to have organized. Uh, when I uh, was precipitated into the uh, directorship of branches of the NACP, one of the first things I projected was the idea of the need for training of the people who were carrying on branch activity. And when I said training, largely in terms of preparing the, giving them the information and then broadening the scope of their understanding of what was involved. Uh, one of the reasons uh, was that I had seen that many, to a large extent, most of the branches were feeling that their duty was to provide some memberships and some money to the national office. They had attitudes that were not particularly uh, helpful in terms of change. For instance, uh, say uh, Atlanta or somewhere else, I'm not identifying Atlanta per se as such, but they would be against the idea of going to the going to battle for the town group who happened to have been maybe brutalized and being arrested because he who was he and in uh, some places like uh, buffalo new york for instance uh they they most of the black children were coming out with uh, high school with just certificates attesting to the fact that they had been in attendance uh, but uh, so uh, I frequently would have people ask me as I came up from the deep south up, say, to Virginia, North Carolina, how are things down south? Which meant that to them, that's where the problem was. And they had not identified the problem in their own area. So... Uh, this is in what, the 50s, the early 50s? The uh, 50s, yeah. Yeah. Oh, late 40s, see, the 40s, up to 46, 47, when I was trapped. Yeah. Now you said that you, you were working, uh, you did some uh, social work in the in Florida, you came up to Mobile and uh, Tampa and all of you. Yeah. Where was that? That was in the 40s. In the 40s. You did that on the old With the NFLACP. I was uh, serving as an assistant field secretary there. How, how was it that you moved into a position at uh, SCLC. What was the process involved? The process there was to say after the 54 decision, after the uh, Montgomery boycott, or simultaneous almost with it, the 54 decision precipitated certain kinds of repressive action against people who attempted to enroll their children in school. Two, two places in particular come to mind. One was Clarendon County, South Carolina. And I think uh, that was Yazoo, Mississippi, uh, where the black people attempted to uh, enroll. And certain repressive actions were taken against them people who were tenant farmers for 30 and 40 years no longer had anywhere to farm. And uh, 
those who had a little, had a little business, and they were boycotted, uh, the, the boycott, were boycotted against them in terms of the delivery of uh, goods and services. So, uh, some of us here in New York, including uh, oh, two or three ministers, one in particular, one black minister who's now dead, that was Jim Robinson, the Reverend James H. Robinson, who was uh, in the Presbyterian Church, the Church of the Master. And he had been associated with the NAACP as a, as a youth secretary. And uh, uh, like uh, Rabbi Wise, I believe it was. Oh, anyway, I, I, I have the list here. But we, we organized, we, they were people who were at prestige. But some of the rest of us, like Byer, George Lawrence, uh, Stanley Levison of the American Jewish Committee, and so forth, the church. American Jewish Congress, I'm sorry, the committee and the Congress are different, uh, organized what was, and some of the labor people organized what was called in friendship. And its purpose was largely to provide some uh, material and legal assistance as much as possible to such people as were being evicted from their uh, tenant uh, farmers uh, households and uh, other situations in Clarendon County and Yazoo and other places. So out of that came um, the, the concept of uh, an enlarged effort, you see. Now, by that time, you were running into, uh, so 54 was the decision. The people were having their difficulties, say, 55 and 56. And then came, uh, in that period, you see, the Montgomery boycott took place. And the boycott then uh, moved on the scene as having involved a large number of people. And uh, so the question arises, where do you go from here? Also, the question arose in respect to uh, mass action. Uh, does the NAACP lend itself to mass action? Or will it initiate mass action? Or will it continue its program of legalism? And so some... This is, pardon me, this is the uh, FD success from the end of the Birmingham Bar Card. Of Montgomery Bar Card. Right, from the Montgomery Bar Card. Yes, it would come at that period. Uh, so the question in uh, some of our minds is that uh, there was something there that should be continued, that you needed a force in the South that was comparable to the NAACP in some respects. Why? Because the NAACP, in the minds of those of us who were concerned at that stage, primarily dealt with legal action. And although it had a uh, program of branch action, it had not organized mass actions de that lent itself to demonstrations, etc. So then, so if you go to all, so if you think in terms of something in the South for mass action, and it, you would start with the group that had been involved in something. So there was Montgomery. And, out of, and in connection with Montgomery, there were large numbers of black ministers or a number of black ministers throughout the area who had identified with that struggle. For instance, uh, C.K. Steele in Tallahassee, Florida, and uh, Abraham of something, something, something or other in uh, New Orleans. Yeah, Jameson. And, uh, Jameson had had a uh, boycott of his own in the... Uh, in um, uh, Baton Rouge, you see. So what you do then uh, is uh, stimulate the thought of an organization in the South uh, that can uh, spread the At this point, you may be able to help me clear up another question, too. There's a question as to where uh, the, ni the initial call uh, for this conference uh, stemmed from. Uh, reading a book like Lewis uh, Miller, uh, they suggest that uh, the call came from C.K. Steele. Well, I went down and interviewed Reverend Steele, 
and he assured me that the call didn't come from him. He responded to the call. He said, some Jewish talking or some funny talking man called him. He's always thought it was Bear Breston and asked him if he would go along with the conference in late 56, late December 56. And he said, yeah, it was just this kind of a thing. He had just finished this Tallahassee thing and they were at the Civic Council. So I'm trying to pin down if it's any way possible. I don't know whether you can pin it down other, because now I, I think by it may not uh, verify the fact that uh, there were three of us who talked into the wee hours of the morning in terms of how do you develop a force that can uh, enlarge upon the gains or the impact of the Montgomery Force boycott. Excuse me now. Did the three represent you, Byer, Levinson, and, 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 and yes, Stanley, Stanley Levinson? Levinson. Largely at Stanley's house. So he was a man with some money. And uh, Byers and I would go over there, not living where he used to. Why me? Because I knew the South, uh, comparatively, in terms of their knowledge of it. They had not had as wide knowledge as I had, plus the fact I had uh, been associated with the NAACP. And so uh, uh, we talked in the three hours and the concept of trying to develop out of it, out of the Montgomery West Boy Guard leadership a force. And uh, when they uh, approached, no doubt, uh, Martin and whoever else, it was largely their response to me, would be in terms of ministers. Now, that's why you get the ministerial thing. You couldn't uh, think in terms of a leadership out uh, around a bus boycott without also thinking of C.K. Steele's efforts and Jameson's efforts. McCullough, uh, South Carolina. Well, McCullough he had... Came a little bit after he that. came a little bit after that. But you see, then when you go into the whole question of, uh, as which was the pattern in the South, who are the leaders? The ministers, which may or may not be justifiable, but that's how it started. And so then, uh, uh, let's say, uh, the call came from Martin. Yeah, well, that's the way it's been basically reported. Yeah, but uh, they thought, uh, historically, he gets credit for it. But the truth, let it be known that no one individual really conceives yeah. of an idea like that without uh, somewhere, somehow, some other things some other input. Right. Now, uh, <clears throat> I can see a great deal of participating uh, happening to uh, leading to the founding of SCLC. The next question in my mind is, after this was realized that there was a need for uh, somewhat of an instrument to try and spread this movement that was in Montgomery with the hope of bringing about greater social change, what was the notion of the kind of an organization you would have? Uh, I know you said you would have a great deal of ministers, but would it be one with just the president and a lot of lieutenants, a president and an executive secretary with a great deal of power? Uh, was it a democratic organization in conception, a strong dictatorial organization? What was the thinking about the nature of the organization at this time? Well, the thinking about the nature of the organization would vary with the people who were doing the thinking. Okay. Uh, those of us who preferred uh, an organization that was democratic and where the decision making was left with the people uh, would think in one vein and the organizing of active, let's call it chapters or units of people. But when you reckon with the fact that the majority of the people who were called together were ministers, and the decision as to who was called together uh, emanated, no doubt, from both uh, the background out of which, let's call it, Martin and uh, those came, and uh, maybe lack of understanding, I'm willing to grant, of the virtue of uh, utilizing the mass uh, 
surge that had developed say, in Montgomery. Just look at Montgomery. What has happened since in Montgomery? What? Right, but there's another problem here. So uh, I think that came, uh, the nature of the organization became to a large extent a ministerial thing. Out of the 100 plus, I forgot how many, that were present at that initial meeting where the formal organizing organization took place, I think Whitney Young and a um, guy from Mississippi, um, um, whom uh, I had worked with for a number of years. Um, uh, I can't think of his name. Uh, Henry? Uh, no, no, no. Uh, uh, Anthony Moore in Cleveland, Mississippi, uh, had, were among the maybe two or three non-ministers present. And I was the only woman. I think maybe another person came and sat in with them. Do you think the reason for that was also the ministers uh, at that time? They had, Basically, I mean, yes. They, they had the, uh, the power to well, not only, you see, not only the power, them put together. No, not only the power, but uh, uh, there, when you haven't been accustomed to mass action, and they were, you see, you're, basically your ministers are not people who go in for decisions on the part of people. I don't know whether you realize it or not. Oh, but they believe I'm giving it to me. Yeah, she, see, see the, and, and you see, they had been looked upon as saviors. And uh, so what happens is, here they are faced with uh, a suggestion that goes against the grain and for which they are not, pre with, uh, with which they are not prepared to deal. So they come together. There's one other question. Right and forth. Namely, uh, uh, the question involving uh, Dr. King, uh, first few years of president of SCLC, and at the same time he was still president of the MIA. And I'm wondering if, if that ever caused any friction or any friction uh, on the part of the people in uh, Montgomery, the MIA people in trying to secure funds, and the SCLC people in trying to uh, get funds. It seems to me that Dr. King would have been the main instrument for both organizations uh, in, in bringing funds and in, in, in the operation. Was there well, any problem in that regard? I think uh, your best uh, person for uh, focusing on that problem, if there were one, would be such as Nixon, uh, too, because he was the treasurer and he resigned, and he resigned for certain reasons. Uh, but it wasn't so much the problem of, uh, let's call it, the dual uh, function of King, uh, because unfortunately, in retrospect, what you are seeing, you're looking in retrospect, and but at the initial stages, you have to reckon with the fact that most of the people involved had never had any experience in developing mass action. And they function largely in the church vein. That if you had a meeting and you preached to the people, and the people would go out and do what you say do and come back, you see. So it wasn't a question of opening it up. It was largely ministers, and, uh, uh, just about all ministers. Well, and, uh, Grandma Tilly was the first executive director of SCLC. That's right. Now, uh, uh, one of the persons contending for an executive director according to the sources I looked at was Reverend Martin Luther King Sr. You know, it was a constant thing of his. In each one of the uh, few minutes I saw, and I haven't been able to see all of them, uh, he would tell him, don't forget we've got to get an executive director. You know, you always try to look for little nuances or things that are giving you some kind of a hint. And I got the impression now that he was hoping they would hurt to get somebody where he could take some of the pressure that he off of his son. Uh, what's your thinking in that regard? Do you think that's... Uh, well, it could well be, because I don't think at the stage uh, even of the Montgomery bus boycott, uh, Martin Luther King Sr. was ready for the role that uh, Martin was... Uh, catapulted into, and I use the term advisedly. 
because uh, I don't think uh, Martin Luther King Sr. nor Jr. had uh, uh, thought in terms of their, his uh, juniors in juniors being in Montgomery in terms of developing a mass action program. You see, um, they were still ministers. And so he probably was uh, uh, thinking of an executive uh, director uh, to take some of the uh, pressure as he conceived of it off of Martin, plus the fact, uh, see, the uh, CLC as such was formally organized uh, over a year before it had any office or any executive at all. How do you explain that? Well, how do you explain that uh, in the middle of 1959 they reduced the executive staff to one? Namely you. Well, it, uh, I was the one. See, I opened the office. I set up the office of the CLC. And uh, that's the story I'll tell some other time. But I will not go into detail. Uh, because I went there uh, primarily to do to their first program, which was to have 20 odd meetings in different cities simultaneously on the same night, which is February 12th. But I went there uh, primarily to do to their first program, which was to have 20 odd meetings in different cities simultaneously on the same night, which is February 12th. Citizenship. Yes, and for the both, well, yeah. And uh, so I had anticipated being there about six weeks, give myself four weeks to, to get the thing going, and two weeks to clean it up. But they had no body. And how did they get Reverend Tilly? Uh, see, they wanted a ministry, I knew that. They couldn't have tolerated a woman, and they couldn't have tolerated a woman. Well, let me, let me repeat re something. I had occasion to look at the uh, uh, criteria for selection that was suggested by Dr. King and a couple of people to when? the selection committee. When was, the criteria, when was the criteria suggested? Though? Well, in 58. Uh, that's what, uh, that's yeah. a difference. It was 58, prior right. to the time, and, and, and Dr. King emphasized that they shouldn't just confine that consideration to ministers, you know, and I thought it was kind of strange that he made that point, but I think that uh, it was made advisedly in that uh, he wanted to encourage bringing in uh, people with a few more administrative skills that, that he believed ministers had, you know, and, but anyway, they wound up getting Dr. Tilly. But as soon as Dr. Tilly resigned, you stepped in and became uh, executive director. And from the sources I've seen, I also see where you conceived this idea of the citizenship crusade. And uh, you spare a lot of detail, some of the things you felt should be done. Did you encounter any difficulty in trying to get this problem over, or was SCLC glad to get it, this proposal? Well, first place, Dr. Tilly, Reverend Tilly became the executive, largely because I knew Tilly. They had, um, I knew they wanted a minister. See, Byatt was uh, scheduled to go down even at the time I went instead of me. I hadn't thought of it. I never had anticipated uh, to set up the office. And after setting up the office, and after the program of uh, February the 12th had taken place, there became pressures from the people, the ministers who were involved, for a organis an organization. A person whom you might uh, talk to if you ever get around to it is uh, a minister in, um, in Nashville, Smith, Maine Smith. Kelly Smith. Kelly, Kelly, Kelly Miller Smith, Smith, yes. Very uh, perceptive young man at the time. And um, uh, so when they, they wanted, they hadn't found anybody, or at least they hadn't decided on, they, I, they thought in terms of Dr. the young man who's now dead, I think who became president of Birmingham, 
college, uh, Pitts. Pitts. Pitts uh, was a teacher in Georgia, and I had known him in my NACP days. So I went to him and talked with him. And he asked me to talk with him. They had made some slight overtures to him, and then he decided he couldn't do that. So um, I suggested they had waited on around. Nothing was happening. Uh, some day they, they see what was happening was nothing except what I was doing in the office there. And um, so I suggested since they had to have a minister, there was, and I heard that Tilly had been responsible for a voter registration drive in Baltimore, uh, which may or may not be quite accurate because that was uh, no doubt masterminded by the president of the Baltimore branch NACP, Mrs. Jackson, and her daughter, Juanita, who was the wife of Clarence Mitchell, who was the NACP uh, Washington Bureau person. So anyhow, uh, they never got around to calling anybody. So Stanley and I met Tilly here in New York. Tilly said he would be interested. And then he went down to see them. And he became the executive director, and uh, but he maintained his church connections in Baltimore, which meant he was in and out. And so whatever was being done in terms of continuity it had to be done by whoever was there, and it was me. Right. These first three years of SCLC operations, 57 to 16, you were, if not an intimate participant, right there where you could see most of what was going on. So my question to you is just what was the role of the executive director of SCLC in contrast to the role of the president of SCLC, Dr. King? Uh, well, they, uh, different from the role of the uh, director in uh, contrast uh, uh, with uh, such organizations as NACP, uh, CORE, and so forth. Uh, the executive director was more or less uh, uh, under the, un, not under the direction, but nominally under the direction. The personality that had to be played, played up was uh, uh, ML, the Dr. King. The, the other organizations, if you notice, the executive director was the spokesman. And, but you see, they couldn't have tolerated uh, having an old lady, uh, even a lady, and an old lady at best. Uh, it was too much for the masculine and ministerial ego to have permitted that. And uh, so, <laughs> there you are. You show great insights in this period. I've been looking over it. You may call it hindsight, but uh, it seems to me that you were up on what was going on. Uh, you made some recommendations to uh, 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 SCLC or some of the long-range things you felt they should do. And two things you felt they should do in particular, namely try to create a program where they get more women involved in the movement and try to come up with some program to get more of the youth involved in the movement. And this was before the Greensboro thing. And I regard this as being a great deal of insight. What was it you had seen which made you realize at that point in time uh, that women and youth uh, would eventually be playing vital roles or they should be included at that point in time in trying to bring about whatever social change was taking place? Well, I guess from my own experience, but basically in terms of the church, all of the churches depended in terms of things taking place, it was women, not men. Men didn't uh, do the things that had to be done. And you had a large number of women who were involved, say, in the bus boycott. And they were the people who kept the spirit going, I think. And they, yeah, and uh, the young people. And then, of course, uh, I knew that young people were the hope of any movement. And so it, it was just a normal thing to me. 
Uh, and ministers, you see, the average Baptist minister didn't really know organization. Now this I know most people would be highly critical of, as they were. What happened was a minister would come into a church and he would follow the pattern that had been there all along. You'd have a, a Sunday school, a ladies' home, or a, a ladies' auxiliary, and of this. All the yeah, change that he would do, all. all that he did was change the person who was in charge, you see. Yeah, it wasn't created. And uh, so, what that? Is there anything that happened in the letter, 59 or 60 or whatever, which triggered the SCLC to start moving really, you know, using that stage in 57 to 60 as an organized, and, uh, you know, really to well, what triggered it, it was the formation, the more thing that maybe triggered it more than anything else to get into a broad program of action or effort to action. This was, was the formation of the, uh, the existence of SNCC. The sit-ins, out of the sit-ins came SNCC. And SNCC was an action in this group, activist group. And, uh, have you read The Making of a Black Revolutionary by James Foreman? Yes, yes. And I, everybody uh, give you credit for bringing about two almost profound compromises in terms of SNCC and SNCC's relationship to SCLC. The first one, and I'd like you to clear me up if I'm in error on this, uh, took place in that second organizational meeting that they uh, had in uh, no, the first one led to the actual calling of the, of the meeting. You believe, and you expressed that in, 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 in the papers I've seen, uh, that in order to uh, keep the spirits going among these young people, keep them from being discouraged and resort to violence, we better get them some kind of coordination and uh, direction going right here in organization. So you talk this CLC into underwriting this Raleigh conference at your former school there. Then that's where you first got together, where you brought all these students in from North and South and some leaders. And uh, the, the young people, from what I can gather, was a little skeptical about Dr. King at that time, but they were somewhat high on Reverend Lawson, you know. But uh, they went along with adding non-violence to their uh, uh, platform because of the influence of people like you and Reverend Lawson, in addition to the charisma of uh, Dr. King. And the second one, where you brought about a compromise at that Montego uh, at the Highland Post School. And this one, I think, was a little more significant in that it almost led to the breaking up of SNCC. Uh, you had a group there that wanted to be engaged in military action, you know, confrontation, full problem ahead. You had another group uh, who had been enticed by the overtures to engage the full force in voters' registration, you know. So you suggested that they go both ways. And the young people fought that, and uh, they came away. Well, what they really were fighting uh, over was a question of dominance. Uh, you see, the, those who came out of the non-violent uh, resistance struggle, like uh, Diane Nash and some who came out of Nashville, they were more deeply indoctrinated in the uh, real philosophy and practice of nonviolence than many others. Uh, those who were advocating voter registration uh, had been influenced to a large extent by their meetings with such personalities as uh, Bobby Kennedy. Bobby Kennedy had tried to almost buy them in terms of uh, saying concentrate on getting uh, black people registered. Of course, he had in mind the next election, which would have brought his brother back in, you see. And so, uh, at the Highlander meeting, uh, there were those who uh, contended very heavily uh, for their points of view, to the point that they looked like they were splitting. And uh, I have been accused uh, by a couple of the grown-ups there of uh, not letting them more or less split because those who were 
very dedicated to the concept of nonviolence, did not see that voter registration would precipitate a conflict, uh, not a conflict, but a confrontation with violence. Had to. The nature of the kinds of areas into which they were going, because the young people decided after well, this was a year, months and months, weeks and weeks, all night and so forth of discussion, they recognized that going to southwest Georgia, going down into deep Alabama and Mississippi meant you were going to be faced with violence. And so, and they, uh, so then, uh, if there were, if, uh, they compromised, it was largely in terms of the fact that the strength of the movement lay uh, in being together, not in division. That was the basis. Uh, I, mine was not a choice of nonviolence versus this. Right. But in mine was in terms of the history of, the knowledge of history that I at least had, and the recognition that where their strength would ultimately lie would be in involving people in mass, but together, not one fighting for nonviolence or something. Right. Can I ask you this? What, uh, during that time, uh, what was uh, the NACP force reaction to uh, their CLC when they, you know, during that time? Did they get well, outwardly, outwardly, it was friendly, let's put it that way. Uh, maybe subterraneously there were uh, concerns about the extent to which SCLC might uh, uh, preempt their role in certain places. But, but, but no, you didn't have any outward conflict. The, the organization pulled an awful lot of people from the NACP. No, I don't think so. No, I don't think it was you, because you didn't accept individual membership. That was one of the that basic. That was one of the basic rules of SCLC in order that, to try and placate organizations like in the Oasis. That was a basic uh, projection from the beginning when those of us who talked in terms of organizing SCL uh, and SCLC or some force in the South was to avoid individual memberships. Uh, which would not place you in competition with the NAACP. Well, Ms. Baker, uh, your idea for a crusade for citizenship did create somewhat of a furor. Uh, I'm mindful of the fact that uh, you tried to get an advisory committee together for this thing, and you sent names out to all of the big people, just so they would lend that name to it. You weren't asking them to really give money, but just to lend that name to it. You sent the raft march, and uh, even sent Roy Wilkins one. And uh, Mr. Wilk is uh, uh, subsequently declined, but he recommended somebody from his group. And But uh, Mr. Park said uh, explicitly uh, that he didn't want to uh, uh, be involved with this uh, uh, citizenship project because he was already on the board of the NAACP and they were engaged in similar action and he didn't want the NAACP to feel that he was encouraging another organization that was doing basically the same thing that they were doing. And beyond that, uh, there were reports in uh, New York Amsterdam News and one or two other papers uh, that Wilkins was a little keyed at this kind of thing. You know, they didn't state specifically what he said, but they got the implication that he was peed. And, uh, uh, obviously, Dr. King felt the same way because I remember a memo that he wrote to uh, uh, the executive board that he was going to try once more to try and get cooperation between his organization and the NAACP. So can you shed a light on that situation for me, or did you detect any kind of antagonism or friction or tension between the two groups at that time? Well, I think uh, what you were faced with was a normal situation in the period, in the context of the period. Here was an organization that was in uh, 1950, the NACP was at least 41 years old. But I think it came into being 1909. It had carried on certain kinds of programs. And here was an individual who had not had any 
real connection, see, they hadn't grown up in the, the struggle. Martin had not historically been a, been a part of any part of the struggle. He was the son of a well-to-do minister, and he was in search of a higher uh, status in terms of education. And uh, I don't think there's any record of his being involved in movements of any kind prior to that. Right. See, yeah. So what do you have? Uh, somebody could say there's an upstart. And uh, I guess these are the human factors. So I'm sure there were te there were strains. For instance, uh, uh, frequently well, Mar uh, Roy would have to be. Uh, sort of convinced, let's say, to put it politely, uh, to participate in such as the March on Washington and the, the prior to the March, that uh, famous March, prior to that there were uh, uh, the 1957 prayer pilgrimage and then the, there were a couple of marches involving uh, uh, students in terms of schools, uh, this question of school segregation, uh, but the, the, the mass action type thing like that, the NACP at that stage had not been involved with. And naturally, there would be this sense of uh, priority of rights, let's call it. And uh, who was the bridge between that? That was Phil Randolph. You, if you look at the record, never, never did they have a conference in terms of working out without Phil Randolph. Phil had the respect of both. Phil had been, uh, he had articulated uh, the concept of mass action and had attempted, uh, you know, the thing that got balled off. Uh, you know, March on Washington. Yeah, March on Washington in the 40s. And uh, Mrs. Roosevelt and Mayor LaGuardia uh, you know, our good angels of the uh, no, no, liberal no, angels no, no, no. talked him out of it, you see. But uh, NACP could not afford, uh, Roy could not afford to absolutely turn thumbs down on the situation because they could have been left out in the cold, number one. And number two, their deep respect for Phil Randolph. He was really a monument in that Certainly whole so. scenario, yes, and if yes. you look at it, because he uh, initiated the idea to go and talk to the president, uh, the self prayer pilgrimage, and he wanted to have a call-up meeting, but he wanted a forum. Yes. But Roy and Grains have turned thumbs out of that. Now, they didn't go along with him on that. Martin Luther was wholeheartedly in favor of it. Having other leaders aside from themselves coming in and talking to the president, you know, but uh, uh, the Urban League and NAACP didn't think that would be the wisest thing. Well, you time. see, they couldn't trust Corp. <laughs> <That's laughs> in their it. minds, you no, see. That's right. you see, and they, they, you see, what you have there is the uh, uh, division between those who have some respect for mass action and pressure and those who believe that your best uh, uh, results came from negotiations uh, from the knowledgeable people, you see. And the negotiations from the knowledgeable and legal action were the NAACP and the Urban League. There were four of the people who, uh, four of the names that, uh, that, that were frequented in this whole uh, episode, and I'd like to mention them to you and just uh, get you to give whatever response you can to them. Uh, I mentioned them and give you my impression of what they were doing. You had uh, Stanley Levinson uh, from the time of uh, his involvement in writing the book Stride Toward Freedom, clean on up until I have been able to see documents beyond the year of 62. Uh, the man was, was Keene's constant uh, advisor, you know, he just reveled in the man, you know, he just regarded King as being something super special. And he didn't charge him a penny for all of the legal work he did, not in print. He told that he did not want him to pay him anything. He was doing this because he wanted to participate in the movement, and this was one way he could try and look out for him, you know. 
And every important decision I think he made, he either consulted with Levinson or he got some advice from Levinson. Where do you find this? Uh, in the papers in Boston, Boston University. King's Papers. King's Papers. I see. And he put all of them down there, King's Papers. That man wrote him on everything, on his book, on his taxes, on his dealing with Fred Gray down in Alabama when Gray wanted to rip him off for so much money to represent them, on being out of Chicago. The whole episode, this man was giving King advice, and King seemed to have regarded his advice highly. So what was your impression of Stanley Levinson, number one? Another individual was Bea Rustin. Rustin gave him a great deal of advice. And uh, there's something that, that's puzzling me in David Lewis's book. He mentioned that, that, that about the middle of 1959, no, no, not the book. Uh, King backed out in the last minute on his participation in the Southern Conference on Education Farm because he feared that he might be, you know, called a communist or being sympathetic toward communists. But at the same time, he was getting ready to make a recommendation to the board that they hire a Bear Rustin as his special assistant. And there was already rumors out that Rustin might be associated or might have socialist and communist leanings. You know, so this is somewhat, I, I, don't, I can't reconcile how on one hand he would just completely disassociate himself with self, uh, yeah. scale. And on the other hand, he's going to wholeheartedly endorse uh, 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 Rustin when he pointed out in his recommendation that he was mindful of the fact that this might be misinterpreted. People might uh, pivot our going in different directions. But this he felt that Rustin was so valuable to him that he had to take that chance. And one other person I want you to speak to is uh, uh, Smiley, Glenn Smiley. Oh, Smiley. Now, uh, Mr. William Miller, who worked with F.O.R. along with Smiley, wrote King around the middle of 1959. This is where all of this was coming to head. Uh, but that, and suggested to him that there was a, 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 some friction between Smiley and Rustin, and that both of them were trying to get his attention, you know. And King replied to him by saying that, yeah, he had been observing that for, for a number of months now, but he was at a loss to know exactly what to do about it. But there's no question about Smiley's commitment, you know, uh, to the nonviolent principles and the fact that he was willing to give his all to SCLC and the cause of nonviolence. So these individuals, in addition to yourself, keep coming And he was out. giving his call all not to SCLC, that was to the Montgomery Books boycott. Right. Did, did he, was he part of an SCLC? Not that I know of. Okay, very good. No. Right. You see, so what is your major question? I My guess? major question is, how did you perceive being close to the uh, whole uh, uh, movement, the role of these gentlemen? Was it similar to the one I portrayed, uh, or do you see it differently? No. Uh, so... Stanley, number one, uh, comes out of the American Jewish Congress. He had some prior knowledge of the value of social action because the Congress was not uh, just a, an organization of top heavy individuals alone. But you see, the Jewish people have been de people who demo did a lot of demonstrating. Uh, so he, um, and he was part, as I said, part of to the initial discussions, uh, thinking of how do you keep alive what has come out of uh, what has been demonstrated in the Montgomery Bus Boys. So uh, you were raising the question of his dedication. He didn't have to charge because he had income, he had business, and uh, he was knowledgeable about fundraising. And uh, whatever his personal motivations for doing it, you would have to find out from him. But uh, his, uh, uh, the fact that he was involved before in social action. Uh, see, I met Stanley when I was president of the local branch of the NAACP. And he and I, he called upon me for 
uh, trying to get uh, some action out of the NACP against the McCarran Walter Immigration Act. You see, uh, many times there are other groups, especially in the New York area, that are much farther advanced, further advanced in terms of dealing with social issues uh, than, that affect the whole population than the NACP, which was concentrating primarily on race. So Stanley and uh, I met, so when the uh, boycott came about, uh, then uh, he knew that Rustin come, came out of the Fellowship of Reconciliation way back, and at that time was with the War Resistance League, and he was, he has a history of dedication to the concept of nonviolence. I have no such history. I have no such uh, uh, concept, I mean, no such commitment in my, uh, historically, nor even now, have I, can I claim that, because I, that's not my way of functioning. So, here you are. You needed somebody who was in, who had the entree to nonviolence, you needed to, and there was another thing, question, how do you pay for these things? So, that explains it. I hope. No, I don't know. It goes a long way in explaining it, because Levinson was a contact in the circles around New York and yeah. other places on the East Coast. Sure. Nobody could get money. Sure. And money was a vital ingredient for this whole thing. Yeah. And uh, he, he also 